When's the last time you've ever believed in something so much that you mortgage your home, cash out retirement, and invest $250,000 of your own money to make your belief a reality? My wife and I did just that. We built what we call Habitat One, or HAB One for short. It's a sustainable food and energy production robot. What does it do? It uses less water to produce the food we need. It optimizes food growth. It doesn't pollute while it creates food. It's scalable and affordable. It produces the energy it needs to make the food that we need. Why am I up here tonight? I'm an engineer, so I love equations. So I took a crack at making an equation for you. First is faith. My wife and I are Christians, and every night we say grace, or before every meal, in fact. And for years and years and years, after I said grace, I would add, and Lord, please help provide food to those that don't have any. And one night, many years ago, I heard him say, well, Jeff, why don't you do something about that? I felt like I just got whacked up alongside the back of my head, and I felt I, I started questioning my belief. Do I believe? Do I believe in what I believe? And if I believe in it, what am I willing to do about it? Well, I decided to start doing something, so I started researching. And in my research, what I found is that by the year 2050, that's just 32 years from now, there'll be 9.5 billion people on the planet. Now, that's a lot of people. How many is it? It's so many people that if you were to stack them on top of each other's shoulders, they can go from the Earth to the moon 43 times. It's a little bit more detailed than that, though. Two reports we need to focus on, one coming out of NASA. 66% of the Earth's underground freshwater aquifers are emptying faster than they can fill today. According to another report from the United Nations, by the year 2050, we need to increase agricultural output by 70%. That means genetically modified foods. That means aggressive agriculture. That means pesticides, herbicides. It means making every square inch of farmable land available to farm. The best we can do is 20%. So here's the problem. Too many people, not enough land, not enough water. So what are you going to do about it? Let's talk about motivation. Back to why am I up here. So through a series of what I call divine interventions, I ended up leaving the Air Force that I love so much and coming home with no plan, which is not me. I plan things. They call my dad and I the clones. We basically look the same, think the same, talk the same. The only real difference between us is that I have a lot less hair than he has. I had to tell you that to tell you this. Six months after I came home, he was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. Remember, I didn't have a reason to come home. I just felt, through these divine inventions, I was supposed to. He never smoked, no asbestos. Six months after he was diagnosed, he was gone. He was months away from retirement, he was 61. Why is that important? In his death, he gave me one last lesson. Life is too short not to take risks and not to try. Let's move on. Grit. In my day job, because what you're going to see up here, by the way, is what I do in the morning, at nights, and on the weekends. I have a normal job. And in that job, I'm responsible for taking ideas and making them reality. I'm not bad at it. At least people tell me that. Now, I've been told that I'm a person who gets things done. A person with grit. I really like that description because it's a good John Wayne reference. I mean, it's pretty cool. I'll accept that one. Hey, but to do what we need to do, you need grit. If you're going to put it all on the line, you better have some. You also need knowledge. I'm an aerospace engineer by degree. I work at a subsidiary of the Boeing company in my day job. And, uh, I believe as an engineer, I believe all engineers have a responsibility to use the knowledge that we gain through education to help everybody else around us. In fact, if you look at my life and you summarize all my experiences, you see that that's kind of about who I am, serving others. I like doing it. But what does that all add up to? 
I realize that this equation is completely subjective and we can spend all night arguing about it, but tonight I'm up here, so it means hope. <laughs> so why do we need this hope? If you're under the age of 50 and you're in this room right now, you will be dealing with these problems. Before us, we could say it would be our children or our children's children, but not anymore. Now it's you. It's here now. So what are you going to do about it? We decided to start looking at different technologies to try to figure out how we can bring them all together to create a system that yet we haven't seen anyone else bring together all these different things to help solve these problems. Two fundamental aspects of our system. You'll probably know some of them. Aquaponics for growing food and anaerobic digestion for creating power in all types of weather and light conditions. This is our system. Aquaponics, if you're not familiar with it, is basically a really cool relationship between fish, bacteria, and plants. We take fish waste, we move it to a place where bacteria can break that waste down and turn it into plant food. Plants then eat that food and they leave behind nice clean water. We return that water back to the fish. The good thing about aquaponics it uses 90% less water than traditional agriculture and it allows you to go vertical, which means we can put food growth into places where we don't need farmable land. Fish need food just like we need food. The good news is many fish live off of algae. So our system requires the growth of algae. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never tried to grow algae on purpose. I can grow it everywhere when I don't want it, but I can't grow it when I want it. In fact, I tried growing algae and I kept giving it a sunburn. Did you know that algae can get a sunburn? I didn't. <laughs> I didn't know that at all. All right, uh, anaerobic digestion. All right, here's what happens there. Is you have bacteria again, these little buggers that we keep washing off our hands, they're so valuable to us. So anaerobic digestion is where you have bacteria and they break down organic waste and it creates two byproducts. One of them is an organic liquid fertilizer packed full of nutrients that you can recycle back into the system. The second one is called biogas. Biogas is essentially methane, car cow's farts. Uh, you might know it better as natural gas. Why do you need something that produces power like that? Because you can't depend on solar and wind isn't much better and I think this picture pretty much highlights why. This is at our place. This is the anaerobic digester. Now this is in our design. You can go buy these. We bought this kit. It goes down in the ground, top left hand corner. That's 12 feet down in the ground. It's 12 feet in diameter. And then on the top of it is a neck. You can see that in the top middle picture. And on the far right hand side, you can see where there's actually a little container built in. That's where the methane is stored. So all the digestion happens down in the stomach and the gas bubbles up to the top. Our system has six major inputs, seven if you include air, but that's not shown on the screen. I'm going to summarize a few of them right now. First, we can take dirty water. It doesn't need to be clean. That's a pretty cool thing. And we can use that in aquaponics. Now, it has to be safe for fish. That is a caveat there, but we can use it. Next, you might have heard of a gas called carbon dioxide. It's kind of making a lot of news these days. A little bit of a stink, you might say. Uh, so. We can take in more carbon dioxide than we produce. Why is that? Because algae and plants love to eat carbon dioxide. They give us oxygen in return. So this system is also bioregenerative, meaning that we can produce things that we need off the system. Finally, waste. We have lots of it. Now, this system can't take care of plastics and all that, but organic waste, it can take care of just fine. Not only can it recycle waste from itself, meaning like plant clippings and leftover things that are organic, but it can also take in things from outside. You can bring in manure. You can bring in your grass clippings from your yard or your table scraps. All of those things can come into the system. They just help bring in more nutrients and create more power. Now you can put human waste into these, but you need some additional processing in order to help with that. Right now our digester has a little bit of a problem. It likes to eat a lot once, but then if you let it kind of go around and graze, it's not so good at the grazing thing. We need to fix that. So we do still depend on solar power. We have a 16 and a half kilowatt system. It powers the entire HAB. It also powers our house. And on sunny days that are beautiful out in eastern Washington, uh, we can have enough energy left over to go back into the grid. 
In the middle of the screen is actually a biogas generator. We've actually had that running off of the digester and producing power on its own. You, you need to keep all these systems happy with respect to temperature and humidity and light. So you need an environmental control system that does just that. Now the cool thing about environmental control systems that control humidity is they have a really great byproduct, clean water. Remember I said you can bring in dirty water? Well, you get clean water out if you so choose. We found that as we built this system, the environmental control is the largest power-hungry hog you could possibly have in the system. Lighting, CO2 introduction, bringing in new air, all of those things take a lot of energy. So if you want to come up with a solution for the future, you have to address the energy needs. You'll notice the propane tanks and the propane heater have a little asterisk in the word propane. That's because we haven't solved the digester problem yet. We're still working on how to get that thing to load correctly. Now, we know it works, but we can't get it continually loading. So when we do get that problem solved, then we'll replace the propane with the natural gas coming off the digester. Have you ever had a garden or a, a cat, a dog, uh, maybe kids perhaps? Well, a garden means you have to take time to tend to it and uh, your cat needs the litter box changed, and the dog needs to be walked. And if you have kids, they need to be taken everywhere. Time is the one thing we do not have enough of. And no matter how hard we wish, we can't make more of it. So we need to use technology, automation in particular, to monitor and control this system so that you, while you use this system, still have time to live your normal life. I'm flying on an airplane uh, just a few weeks ago from Portland down to LAX. And uh, I, it's, it's one of the first few days we've had hot weather up here, and I'm a little concerned about the system. So I go in to the Wi-Fi on the airplane. I connect with my smart device. I dial into the system, and I'm there at 35,000 feet checking in on everything. I can control the lights. I can control the valves. I can see my system log. I can see what's working right. I can see what's working wrong. It has unlimited potential for what I can do, but most importantly, it means I don't need to be there in order to make this system work. Finally is facilities. You need a big building to put what we've done in, but this thing scales really well. HAB1 is actually 80 feet long by 40 feet wide and 22 feet at the center line at the top. It can feed 16 adults 365 days a year every single day when it's at full operating capacity. You don't need one that big. <laughs> we went big like this because technology is very hard to make it small, so we started large to uh, make that easier. What do you get out of this? Fresh fruits and vegetables. You get protein in the form of fish or aquaculture. You get clean water coming out of the system. You also get natural gas that you can use in vehicles. Can't wait to convert my truck so I can actually run it off of the system. Uh, and you also get electricity that you can use to run your own facilities. It's really cool having technology, but without a little bit of life in there, it really doesn't do us any good. The really cool thing is that this system is, in fact, working. It is alive. We've already stopped buying uh, leafy vegetables from the store. We have green beans, cauliflower, and broccoli on the way. We have green onions and carrots. We have garlic and kiwi. We have kiwi growing in eastern Washington up at 2,400 feet where we live on a road called Snowed Inn. Okay? <laughs> That's pretty cool. How about cantaloupe and watermelon? We have strawberries and sweet onions. We have potatoes, Martian potatoes without human poop, okay? That's important to realize as well. You'll see why soon. And corn. We have beets and we have lavender growing. We have a whole slew of different herbs growing in the system. We have fruit trees growing in the system. The banana tree and the grapefruit tree are doing the best right now. Now, in order to help pay for all this, my wife, who is here tonight, I love you, uh, uh, is actually, she, under the Raymond Ranch brand name, actually um, grows and packages microgreens, and we sell them to our local community. So we actually sell them to restaurants and also to grocery stores. In fact, if you've ever been over to Salty's, uh, we sell our product there. You may have had it once or twice. The really cool thing is that we're about two customers away from breaking even, so the system is going to start paying for itself. I'd say that while HAB1 is operational, it's only partially operational. We still have about 10 major problems to solve before I can claim that. Three of them, if I were to summarize all of them, really cover it. And the first one is, I've already said, loading the digester. Continuously loading the digester is a major problem for us. Uh, the second one is vertical growing. There are many challenges with vertical growing that a lot of people have faced before us, but it's something that we need to overcome. And finally is heat control, both in the winter and in the summer. And when we solve these things, pretty much we're, we're done with the system. 
I get asked a lot, how come you built something so big? I alluded to it earlier that uh, we actually did it because a lot of the technology doesn't exist at a small level. And you, know, you can experiment with it in your office like we did. This is where we started. We didn't start big. We spent five years doing research, and then we built the system the, in our office, and it worked. We learned a lot. In fact, everything we learned in the office, we see translate one-to-one -one in the large-scale facility. That means we have a solution that scales. That is hugely important. They call me the real Martian. You heard him say the Mars thing earlier. Now, why is that? Well, if you're not familiar with the book, it's a great book, but the movie's also great as well. It's one of my favorites. Came out a few years ago. Guy gets stranded on Mars. What do you do? So it came to me because my neighbor is a big YouTuber. He came over and he's like, man, hey, can I take a video of what you, you guys are doing? And I'm like, okay, yeah, and we just got it built. It was snowing outside. It was below freezing. We already had feet of snow on the ground. It was so cold inside the building. We didn't have, we were completely underprepared. We had to put plastic over the top of the two grow lanes that we had and then use diesel heaters in order to keep everything above freezing. Diesel. That's not good. Okay. But he was still really impressed. So he's walking around. He's got his camera and he pokes around the outside of the camera. And he's like, man, this is really cool. You're like the real Martian. <laughs> and me wanting to, you know, I'm an astronaut wannabe. I was like, well, yeah, I guess I kind of am. So that name stuck. But we also started our own YouTube channel, which you can get to by going to this link and following us. We have 23,000 faithful followers who are awesome. And uh, we call them Mission Control. They actually act like a form of Mission Control. So we have 23,000 people in a social network that are helping us solve this problem. That's pretty cool. My wife and I, when we, when we started, we had to take a really big leap of faith. Who does something like this? I wake up every day and think I'm crazy. We knew what we wanted to do. Build Hab 1 using good principles as a prototype. Then, as we get that prototype understood, we would go through it and we would optimize it and we would create a second Hab that we would then go test somewhere. Then we'd do it again and create a third prototype. And then finally, our fourth prototype, which would be the one that we'd actually want to take out and deploy globally. Now, an interesting thing occurred when I was working on this. I started realizing that the more sustainable I made the system in design, the more closed loop it became. And that's when it hit me. This isn't just for Earth. There's some pretty cool stuff happening in space right now. And I'm a former aerospace engineer with the Air Force. I like space. So I'm sitting there going, man, this would be really cool. Hey, you know what? After HAB 4, let's send HAB 5 to the space station, HAB 6 to the moon, and HAB 7 to Mars, which is totally nuts. <laughs> but it's still cool to dream. And with enough hard work and sacrifice, dreams do, in fact, come true. So back here on Earth, back in reality, my wife and I, in addition to the Raymond Ranch, we also started G11 Engineering, a nonprofit right now, with the intended purpose to build these systems, design them, optimize them, and get them out there to help people globally. Now, what we'd like to do is get a team of like-minded people together, because I can't just do it by myself. I've been doing all these things by myself right now with my wife's help, and we really need a team. So we'd like to go through the system and then optimize it, like I was just saying. Now, if you get a group of people together that have all these things in common, you do get hope. We know this problem is coming. We can solve it. If we use technology such as HAB1 and we work together, we can solve it. Thank you. <laughs>